I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God in Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd I greet you all brothers, sisters and friends with the Islamic greetings of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Brothers, sisters and friends, today we have an interesting question. Islam or atheism, you decide. Now, before I get into the thick of my argument, I would like to propose something. I would argue that the way human beings must make decisions in their life is a, the way that critical thinkers should make decisions in their lives. Now, you may think this is fancy philosophy, it's not. What I actually mean is that we must base our decisions on ration and reason and common sense. Something that myself and Ed Buckner will agree upon. Let me elaborate with an example. Say for example, we're at home in our living room and we're watching the football, okay? And at nine o'clock in the evening, someone knocks on the door. Knock, knock. Okay, we look through the spyglass and we see Superman with his red underpants. And he says, I'm here to check the gas. And you're thinking, he's here to check my gas meter? That doesn't make sense. So using your reasoning, using your common sense, your critical thinking, you're going to actually phone the gas company and say, do you actually come at nine o'clock in the evening? And have you changed your uniform policy? Significantly, you're gonna be crying out through the door saying, excuse me, sir, can I see some ID? Can I see some paperwork? And from this analogy or this example, we have come to realize that we must use our common sense, our previous information, our intellect, our rational capacities in order to make decisions in our lives. And I would argue today that to support the atheist worldview would be equivalent of allowing someone in their red underpants to come and check your gas meter. Whereas someone supporting the Islamic worldview would be the one with the slightly more critical thinking. And the way I'm going to do this is first suspend my judgment about atheism and wait for Dr. Ed Buckner to respond or provide a good case for the atheist worldview. And now what I'm going to do is provide a positive case for the Islamic worldview. Now what is the Islamic worldview? Now the Islamic worldview is based upon three intellectual foundations. One, the existence of God. Two, the Quran being divine. And three, the truthfulness of the prophets sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace and blessings be upon him claim to prophethood so i'm going to go straight to the first argument god's existence now brothers sisters and friends god makes sense of the origins of the universe because we have all asked the same question why does something exist rather than nothing how did the universe come to being in this light the quran the book of the muslims points to this type of thinking as the quran says or do they think the heavens and the earth, the whole universe, came out of nothing? Now typically, atheists have responded by saying that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. For example, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist on the radio program, he said the universe is just there and that's all. However, brothers sisters and friends, if we conclude, or if we scratch the surface on this statement, we will conclude that it is absurd and irrational. Because that would mean that the universe never had a beginning, which would then mean that our history is infinite, that the universe has an infinite history of past events. But I ask you the question, can this really be the case? Can we have an infinite history? The answer is no, because the infinite does not exist in the real world. Take the following examples into consideration. Example number one. Say we have an infinite number of Dr. Ed Buckners in the room, okay? <laughs> Whether we like that or not, okay? Say we take two Dr. Ed Buckners away, how many Dr. Ed Buckners do we have left? Infinite, as Dr. Ed Buckner has just said. But logically, it's infinity minus two. And if it's infinity minus two, it's less than infinity. And if it's less than infinity, we should be able to count how many Dr. Ed Buckners are in the room, but we can't. It just exists in the mathematical realm of discussion of discourse. Example number two. Now say we have a hundred Dr. Ed Buckners in the room 
And at every possible moment, I add another dot to Ed Buckner. 101, 102, 1001, 1002, a million and one, a million and two. Will I ever reach a number that we can describe as infinite? No, because at every possible moment, I can add another Dr. Ed Buckner. So, in this slide, the mathematicians Kasman and Newman, they said the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense as we say there are fish in the sea. And significantly, brothers, sisters, and friends, the famous German mathematician David Hilbert, he said the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But brothers, sisters, and friends, past events are real. They're not just ideas. Therefore, the number of past events cannot be infinite. Therefore, there was a beginning to the universe, and it logically follows there was a cause to the universe. This is why leading cosmologists and philosophers of science, such as Ellis, Kirchner, and Stoger, they ask, and they answer in the following way. They said, can there be an infinite set of really existing universes? We suggest that on the basis of well-known philosophical arguments, the answer is no. Now, this may sound like philosophical mumbo jumbo. Let's talk about science, okay? What does astrophysical evidence have to say? What does science have to say about this? Now, I would argue that this conclusion is also supported by physics, as you know, You've heard of the Big Bang. Everyone heard of the Big Bang? Hands? Good, and I assure you it's not that thing that happens after too many curries. <laughs> okay, according to the Big Bang, physical time and space was created and matter and energy were also created. The four prominent scientists, Jay Richards, James Egan, David N. Schramm, and Beatrice M. Tinley, they described the event of the Big Bang as follows. The universe began from a state of infinite density, space and time were created in that event, and so was all matter in the universe. I ask you another question. What does infinite density actually mean? Well, it actually means nothing. This is why Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle, he states that the universe at a point in the past was shrunk down to nothing at all. So let's reflect on this. It would actually mean that a proponent of the Big Bang theory or model would require us to believe that something comes from nothing. I'll ask you another question. Out of, does something come from nothing? No, because out of nothing, nothing comes. This is why even atheist philosophers, such as David Hume, he wrote in a letter, I never asserted to absurd proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. Similarly, P.J. Zwart, in his publication about time, said, if there is anything we find inconceivable, it is that something could arise from nothing. And we even have the eminent physicist, Sir Arthur Eddington, concluding the beginning. Seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. So we can conclude based on mathematical, philosophical, and scientific evidence that there's a cause for the universe. It doesn't mean it's God, doesn't mean it's Jesus, doesn't mean it's Allah, it doesn't mean anything. It just means there's a cause for the universe. So we ask another question, what is the nature of this cause? And the nature of this cause upon conceptual analysis, which means critical thinking, thinking about this cause, we come to some startling conclusions. This cause must be one. The reason for this is because if we use the philosophical principle Occam's razor, which posits that we do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then we conclude it must be one. This cause must be uncaused, as we have already discussed the absurdity of an infinite regress of events, similarly with causes. This cause must be immaterial because it created the sum of all matter, which is the universe itself. Significantly, brothers, sisters, and friends, this cause must be personal. The reason I'm saying this is how else can a, an eternal cause bring into an existence a finite effect, the universe that had a beginning in time? It must have chosen the universe to come into existence, and choice indicates a will, and a will indicates a personality. So, we have concluded the traditional view on God. 
that a transcendental, immaterial, uncaused, eternal being exists. Let me summarize the argument for you. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. Let me go straight to the second argument, which is about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. The Qur'an being a signpost to the transcendent. What I mean by this is that the Qur'an can only be best explained by the fact that it is a divine book. And I'm going to use the inimitability of the Qur'an for this. Now, what do I mean by inimitability? What I mean by inimitability is that the Qur'an cannot be emulated, reproduced, matched or copied with regards to its literary and linguistic features. And this has a Qur'anic drive. In the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims in the second chapter, the Qur'an says, and if you are in doubt, talking to the whole of humanity here, to the secularists, to the atheists, to the agnostics, those sitting on the fence, those in the fence, talking to everyone. If you are in doubt about this book, which we have sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then bring one single chapter like it and call on your witnesses and your supporters and your thinkers and your philosophers and your scientists and your Dr. Ed Buckner's if you are actually truthful. And this challenge, brave challenge, has a historical backdrop too. The famous Arab historian Ibn Rashik, he states that the Arabs at the time of Revelation, over 1400 years ago, were Arabic linguists par excellence. They were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic tongue. This is why he says that the only time the Arabs used to celebrate was on the birth of a boy and when a poet rose amongst them. Now this inimitability, this matchlessness, this inability for humanity to try and copy the Quran has been testified by many Western and Eastern academics. For example, A.J. Arbery, the famous translator of the Quran and the famous Orientalist, he said, for the Quran is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. And there are many reasons why the Quran cannot be matched or copied from a linguistic perspective. Some of these reasons include its unique literary form, its peak of eloquence, its unique linguistic genre, and its abundance of rhetorical devices. Now, you don't have to know anything technical about this, but just to let you know that there are key cogent arguments for the inimitability of the Quran. Hence, Paul Casanova, in April 1909 at the College of France, spoke about the linguistic power of the Quran. And he says, whenever Muhammad وسلم, was asked a miracle as a proof of the authenticity of his mission, he quoted the composition of the Quran and its incomparable excellence as proof of its divine origin. And in fact, even those who are non-Muslims, nothing is more marvelous than its language with such apprehensible plentitude and grasping sonority. But I think I could hear the question in your head. And I think it's saying something like this. Well, how does it make it divine? How does it make it come from God? How does it make it a miracle? And that's a very good question. But as we agreed, we're going to use our logic. And if we use logic, we will come to that conclusion. And I'm going to use something called logical deduction. What is logical deduction? Logical deduction is a thinking process where you start with a universally accepted statement and from that, drawing logical conclusions. But I think there's another question in your head. And the other question in your head is, but I don't know nothing about the Arabic language. I mean, most of us come from the Asian some continent. So what do we know about Arabic? Another very good question. Well, you don't have to know, every, you don't have to know anything about the Arabic language. Put your hand up if you really believe that China exists. Good. Now, put your hand up if you've been to China before. Eight people. So for the majority of us, we still believe China exists. And I ask the majority of us, have you ever spoken to a Chinese person before? In China. <laughs> have you eaten Chinese food? In China. I want some English tea. So we haven't done this, but we believe that China actually exists. But you may argue, but it's on the map. Well, if I drew you a map and I said, this is planet Zongo, and I'm a Zongolian, and I come from the planet Zugula, does that mean it really exists? No. But the reason we believe this, and if we study epistemology, the study of knowledge, we will come to the conclusion that we believe in these things because it's 
testimony. It's recurrent reporting. It's a universally accepted statement. This is why the philosopher and historian C.A.J. Cordy in his book, Testimony, a Philosophical Study, he highlights our dependency on, on this very fact. And he says, many of us have never seen a baby born, nor have most of us examined the circulation of the blood, nor the actual geography of the world, nor any fair sample of the laws of the land. Nor have we made the observations that lie behind our knowledge that the lights in the sky are heavenly bodies immensely distinct. So, I would argue, for you to reject the miraculous nature of the Quran would be equivalent of saying that China does not exist and even saying that the world is not round. We believe it's round, why? Have we actually felt its roundness? Have we gone to Australia and had a huge headache? No. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's based upon recurrent reporting. Now, what is the universally accepted statement with regards to the Quran based upon Eastern and Western scholarship? Well, it is as follows. Those best placed to challenge the Quran have failed to meet its challenge. And there is a consensus amongst Western, non-Muslim, Eastern, Muslim scholarship. For example, the highly acclaimed professor and Arabist Hamilton Gibb, he states, the Meccans still demanded of him a miracle, and with remarkable boldness and self-confidence, Muhammad appealed as a supreme confirmation of his mission to the Quran itself. Like all Arabs, they were connoisseurs of language and rhetoric. Well then, if the Quran were his own composition, other men could rival it. Let them produce 10 verses like it, and if they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept the Quran as an outstanding evidential miracle. Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Quran, A Biography, he says, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. So let's now draw the logical conclusions. We know the book can actually come from an Arab, a non-Arab, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or God himself. Now firstly, the Quran could not have come from an Arab because the Arabs at the time of Revelation who were the best place to challenge the Quran, the Arabic linguists par excellence, failed to challenge the Quran. They haven't even admitted that it could not come from a human being. For example, the best linguist of the time, his name was Walid ibn al muhira he says, by God, this cannot come from a human being. The Quran could not have come from a non-Arab because obviously you need to know the Arabic language in order to successfully challenge the Quran. Now I think the most important point lies in the fact that many people claim that the author was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Prophet Muhammad could not have been the author. The reason being because he was an Arab himself. And like all Arabs, they failed, so he's included in that logically. Significantly, the Arabic linguists at that time never accused him of being an author. He said it, they would say things like, it's magic. Significantly, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had amazing trials and tribulations in his 23 year prophetic career. His beloved wife died. His young children passed away. He was boycotted from his beloved city. His companions, beloved companions were tortured and killed. He loved children so much that he would almost curse someone for not kissing their children. But he was stoned by children in a town in Arabia where the blood was dripping from his legs where the scholars would say that his sandals were stuck to the sand. This was the reality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muslims and non-Muslims agree to this. But yet none of this emotion is in the Quran itself. This is a psycholinguistic impossibility. When you read Shakespeare, some of Shakespeare is in Shakespeare. When you read Homer, some of Homer's work is in Homer. Anyone studying psycholinguistics, which I have done, study grounded theory or discourse analysis, you would see that this author, some of his personalities in this author. But the Quran remains in the divine voice, and many studies have shown this to be the case. Another example why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa can't be the author is because his narrations which have been preserved are in a different distinct style to that of the Quran. And to keep that consistently over a 23 year period is almost impossible. Now the greatest point is this, the greatest point is this. Human expression 
If we have the blueprint, we can emulate it. For example, if you study art, we have the artwork of Monet. He was an impressionist. Wow, amazing art at that time. But now you can copy it. We have many replicas of the same art. But we have the Quran today, a timeless book, 1400 years. We have the blueprint to the words, the letters, the sounds, the grammar, and the meaning, yet we cannot emulate the blueprint. This shows to me that none of the explanations above suffice. So we can only come to the conclusion that the best explanation of the inimitability of the Quran is the divine himself. So let's summarize the arguments as follows. One, the Quran could have come from an Arab, a non-Arab, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or God. Two, it couldn't have been an Arab, a non-Arab, or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Three, therefore it must have been from God. Let's go to the third and final argument. The truthfulness of the claim of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to prophethood itself. We have four options. Borrowing from C.S. Lewis, we have four options. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a liar, he was deluded, he was both, or he was speaking the truth. And let's take each option and use our critical thinking that we agreed that we're going to use in the beginning. Let's take that he's a liar. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could never have been a liar. As we said, he was boycotted, he was stoned. He used to sleep on palm fibers when the kings of Persia and the Byzantines and the Romans were living it high. He never had any worldly gain. He was offered riches, he was offered power, but rejected it for his message. So this is not the psychological profile of a liar. And this is why sincere orientalists such as W. Montgomery Watt, Watt in his book Muhammad at Mecca, he said, his readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Moreover, none of the great figures of history so poorly appreciated in the West as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Significantly, Sir George Bernard Shaw, in the volume The Genuine Islam, he said, I have always held the religion of Muhammad in high estimation because of its wonderful vitality. It is the only religion which appears to me to possess the assimilating capacity to the changing phase of existence which can make itself appeal to every age. I have studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the savior of humanity. Let's go to the next option. We are clutching at intellectual straws here. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was deluded, some people say. But can this really be the case? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us wisdom and advice about developing an economic model for society. Something which American scholars come all the way to Britain to propagate the economic message of Islam. Is this from a deluded person? Someone who thinks he's saying the truth, but in reality is an untruth? Of course not. Look at geopolitics, for example. The liberal capitalist Western model, they believe that there's too many needs, not enough resources, hence excessive competition. But how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam solve the number one economic problem of the 21st century? He said something very simple, that we have essential limited needs and enough resources. When we study geopolitics, we find that there's enough resources on the planet to feed 36 billion people. There's only about 7 billion people at the moment. So is this from a deluded person? Of course not. This is why Michael Hart, in the book The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history, he says, my choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others, but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both secular and religious levels. So how can a deluded person be successful religiously and from a secular perspective? Is this the product of a deluded man? What about the third option? He was both. Well, this is logically and philosophically impossible. You can't know that you're lying and keep a lie and think you're saying the truth, yet it's an untruth at the same time. 
So what are we left, brothers, sisters and friends? We are left that he's speaking the truth. And I think the following quotation from Dr. William Draper in his book, The History of Intellectual Development of Europe, summarizes his point quite nicely. He says, four years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born in Mecca, in Arabia, the man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race. To be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title of messenger of God. So we could summarize this argument as follows. One, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have been a liar, deluded, both, or speaking the truth. Two, he wasn't a liar, deluded, or both, based upon our critical analysis. Three, therefore, he was speaking the truth. So brothers, sisters, and friends, these are very simple arguments that could be understood by an 80-year-old eight, or an 80-year-old. The existence of God, the miracle of the Qur'an, and the truthfulness of the Prophet's claim to prophethood, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I have attempted to show that there are good reasons to choose the Islamic worldview because human beings, as we agreed in the beginning, must base their decisions on our rational faculties, on our reason and our common sense. I believe in order for Dr. Ed Buckner to be successful, he must break down each of my arguments and then con construct new ones for the atheist worldview. So brothers, sisters and friends, I simply leave you with the words of the people of paradise. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Unquestionably, all praise are due to God. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayk. Jazakallahi for listening. Thank you very much.